Today's uh, event is hosted um, by Lisa Sorensen, the Executive Director of Birds Caribbean. She'll come up in just a second. And me, Christine Elder, Natural Science uh, Illustrator. Uh, let's get started. How we're going to roll today is, like I mentioned, the resources are down below where it says um, download your pintail duck image. And that's where you would be able to print out the image we're going to use for the sketching tutorial part that's going to happen um, in about a half hour. Uh, there is a chat box. Now, if you're on Facebook, I believe you might be able to chat as well. Or if you're on Crowdcast over here, you can chat. Love to hear where you're from in the world and if you've ever seen a northern pintail before. So um, then we're going to go over the biology and ecology and anatomy of the pintail with Lisa. And in about 30 minutes, we're going to do the art lesson where we're going to draw the northern pintail with me. We're celebrating World Migratory Bird Day. This is a poster that Environment for the Americas um, has set up and um, is available. And there's lots of uh, interesting facts about these um, focal species that you see on the screen, including the Northern Pintail, which we're talking about today. So I'm with Birds Caribbean, and we're a nonprofit that's dedicated to conserving birds and nature throughout all the islands of the Caribbean. Um, I encourage you to um, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and check us out on YouTube. And on our website, we are, um, through for a celebration of World Migratory Bird Day, we are releasing a Migratory Bird of the Day. So we're posting um, fun natural history facts. We have coloring pages, online puzzles, and activities for, for kids and adult bird videos and calls and recordings, um, drawing webinars like this one that we're doing today, and lots of special events. And uh, today, tomorrow, and Saturday on Environment for the Americas website is Bird Day Live. And hopefully you're, some of you are watching us now on uh, Facebook. But today we have a Caribbean focus and we'll be talking about the Northern Pintail today. Okay, so Northern Pintails. Um, these are ducks that are in the family Anatidae, which is the family that has all the ducks, geese, and swans of the world. And maybe you can think of a few geese and swans that you know, maybe put in the chat box if you know, if you know any other geese and ducks and swans from being outside and going birding. So dabbling ducks are in the genus Anis, and there's actually 45 species in this genus worldwide. Um, some other species in this genus you might recognize, the mallard and the um, blue-winged teal. The mallard is probably the most familiar duck. It's super common. The male has that bright green, green head. And then in the bottom picture, you can see the blue-winged teal. Next slide. That's the male and the female. Oh, and of course, we all are very familiar with um, daffy duck. Um, uh, one of our cartoon characters next. <laughs> so um, how do we know this is a northern pintail and what makes a duck a duck? Well, um, tell right in the chat box if you can think of some characteristics that ducks have. You know, what's unique about ducks? Um, well, you can see, notice a couple things right away from this picture. They're on the water, so they're adapted to living on the water. Yeah, you're right, Donald Duck was in the last picture. They have webbed feet. And that's an adaptation for swimming, of course. Um, the northern pintail, all ducks have a flattened bill. Okay, so it's flattened and it's, it's adapted for feeding in the water and sifting through mud and um, finding seeds and little invertebrates to eat. So they have, um, northern pintails have a blue-gray bill and then they have a central black stripe down the middle. They have a chocolate brown head. They have a white neck and breast with a, a stripe going up the back of the neck. Um, they're a very slender duck. They're medium sized. Um, they have a slender neck and body. On their sides, they have the um, what looks like gray flanks with vermiculation. It's like this very fine pattern of um, like swirls on the sides of their um, of their body. And then they have that white spot toward the rear, which is a good way to spot the duck as well. And you can see that they have elongated scapulars and tertials on their back. And then of course, two very long central tail feathers that are black and that gives it their name, the pintail. And this is what a breeding male looks like. Next. All right, another thing to notice about this duck, uh, the male has iridescence on the back of his head. It's kind of a purplish glossy sheen. And when he's courting the female, he'll, he'll swim away from her and turn his head this way and that way so that the, the light catches the feathers and the iridescence shows up and it's another way that that the male uses to attract the attention of the female. 
And you might know of iridescence, it's most well known in hummingbirds. They have that gorget and where it looks black if it's not shining in the light. But if, again, if they turn their head, you can the, uh, the uh, iridescence shows up and it's a structural color where the light is heading, hitting the proteins in the feather and causing this, this shimmering color. Next. All right, and what's different about ducks also is if you look closely at their wings, um, you can see the primary feathers, which are the outer feathers, the flight feathers, and then the secondary feathers, which are the inner feathers. And there's an area in the what, on the secondary feathers called the speculum, and that is unique to ducks. And it's really helpful in, for ID, especially when the birds are in flight, because most species have a unique speculum. They have different colors on their wings. So on the northern pintail, it's kind of like a greenish or bronze and it's bordered by a buffy color on the front edge and then black, and then you can see a white trailing edge. So when ducks are on flight, you can see that. Um, on the mallard, you can see there, it's very purplish. He has a white trailing edge and white on top. And then even on the pintail, the female, you can see the white trailing edge. She's flapping her wings there in the lower left. So it's the, the, the duck speculum is unique and that can be really helpful in ID. All right, next slide. And you can see here a gorgeous male in prime breeding plumage. He's sitting here preening. Um, ducks spend quite a lot of time preening, um, just like other birds. And they do this for, for a number of different reasons. Um, they're, they're dipping their bill into their oil gland, which is at the base of their tail. And so they're oiling their feathers and they're lining all the barbs on the feathers. And this keeps the feathers um, nice and smooth and in shape. And it keeps, keeps them so that the ducks are waterproof. You know, if you notice the duck splashing around, you'll see droplets of water landing on its back and just rolling off. Um, and so this, this is part of their water, waterproofing to keep them warm and dry on the inside. And when they're preening, they're also lose, um, removing parasites and body lice and things like that. So um, it's really just working to keep their, their um, plumage in tip top shape. Next. Okay, so one thing to notice is that um, many dabbling ducks, like a lot of other birds, are sexually dimorphic. And what this means is that males and females look different. And often in the bird world, males are very brightly colored and it's the females that are, that are more drab and more plain colored. So that is true in many species of ducks. Um, the males are the brightly colored sex. And, and so within ducks, the females are often just mottled shades of different brown. They're still very beautiful, but just much more subdued colors. And um, why, do you, why do you think that um, female ducks would be so drab brown? Write in the chat box why you think that's important. Okay, next. And if you're thinking about the fact that the female birds are the ones that lay eggs, they build the nest, they lay eggs, and they're often the ones to um, raise young, it makes sense because they want to be camouflaged from predators. They want to be sort of earthy tones so that they blend in with the vegetation and they won't be seen by predators, which, which of course can take a female sitting on a nest quite easily. There's foxes and raccoons and, and even birds that will prey on ducks. So yes, camouflage, absolutely. And you see a female here on the nest with newly hatched ducklings. Next. All right, so here's just a few species of dabbling ducks. Um, Northern shovelers, white cheek pintails, those are ducks that are in the Bahamas. Um, that's a duck that I studied for my PhD. In the middle, you can see cinnamon teal. The males are that beautiful, gorgeous, rusty cinnamon color. Lower left are American widgeon and then green winged teal. And you'll notice in most of these ducks, that the, again, the male is brightly colored and the female is just different shades of, of brown and gray and tan. Um, so, so that's a very, very interesting about ducks, you know, they're sexually dimorphic. Um, one other thing that's really interesting is that a lot of tropical and southern hemisphere species, the males and females look alike. So this is true of like the white cheek pintail in the upper, upper slide. The male is in the back and the females in the front. They look almost the same. If you look very closely, you can tell them apart. The male has a slightly brighter red bill spot and he's slightly larger and slightly darker brown. But it's a really interesting question, like why did sexual dimorphism evolve in the northern species, but not the southern and tropical southern tropical hemisphere species? Um, so something to think about, but very, very interesting question. Next slide. So what do northern pintails eat? Um, well, they eat a variety of foods. 
Um, they eat a lot of seeds and tubers and the vegetative parts of aquatic plants throughout the fall and winter. And they also eat aquatic invertebrates and earthworms. And so in the left side picture, they're, they're dabbling and here they're, they're sifting through the mud, they're sucking in water and sifting out seeds and invertebrates through, through the lamellae, which are little fine, fine, little like fine little teeth on the edge of their bill. And so they're filtering out the water with the lamellae. And on the right side, it's called tipping up, bottoms up. And so here you see a bunch of males with their tails up in the air and then, and they're in slightly deeper water. So they're having to paddle with their feet to, to dip their, their bills down into the mud and, and sift through the benthus or the mud to um, find things to eat. So the diet of the duck changes quite a lot by season and by where they live. Um, they do eat lots of vegeta vegetative matter and seeds throughout the year, but in the spring, females especially switch to a diet of eating a lot of insects and aquatic invertebrates. And they need to do this because they need to lay a clutch of eggs. So they need to eat a lot of protein, build up a lot of body fat so that they can lay eggs and then incubate for like 25 days. So um, they switch their diet to um, to eating a lot of insects. And somebody's asking, how long can they stay tipping up? Oh, probably 30 seconds, 40 seconds. I'm not really sure how long they can hold their breath. Um, maybe a minute, um, but yeah, probably 20, 30, 40 seconds at a time. They'll come up, look around, take a breath and, and then go back down again. So when they eat um, aquatic insects, they're eating the larvae of midges and damselflies and dragonflies and water boatmen and crustaceans. And if you do a wetland dip, you can find these critters and um, see, see what the ducks are eating. All right, next slide. Okay, northern pintail dis distribution. So uh, this is the prairie pothole region. On the left, the orange shows the breeding area in North America. You can see that they breed in the, um, in the northern Great Plains up in Alaska and Canada and way far north. Um, that area that's, that I'm pointing to is called the um, Prairie Pothole Region. And this is called, this is known as the Duck Factory of North America. And it's an area that's um, characterized by rolling hills and, and prairie grassland and lots of millions of depressions in the ground called potholes. And they're small wetlands that, that are dotting the landscape. And so actually the grasslands, a lot of it's been converted to farmland. So it's like farmland with all these little wetlands scattered around. And it's a really an important area for, for waterfowl, for shorebirds and grassland birds. And so it's called the duck factory because so many North American ducks are produced in this region. Um, so they, so they, they breed here and then you can see their wintering range in blue. In blue. They use a lot of portions of the Southern US. They, they winter in California, Florida, the Atlantic coast. Mexico, Central America, and Northern South America. They do also get to the Caribbean, but they're not a super common migrant in the Caribbean. And um, they're one of the first ducks to migrate in the fall. Males start arriving on wintering grounds as early as August. And um, females leave a little bit later because they're still raising the ducklings. Um, but the, the peak migration would be in September and October then for females. All right. Uh, Lisa? Yes. Uh Regarding the Caribbean, there was a question in the chat box about how often they come through Jamaica. So I would say they're a pretty uncommon to rare bird in Jamaica. They're just not one of our most common ducks. They show up occasionally, but just in small numbers. Uh, the ducks that would be much more common in the Caribbean and Jamaica would be blue winged teal and lesser scop and greater scop and ring neck ducks. And we get some shovelers and some widgeon and some gadwall. Um, so pintails, pintails show up in just small numbers. It's not the biggest part of their wintering, wintering range. And yes, Jamie, I love ducks too. <laughs> All right, so here on this next map, it's another map showing the uh, distribution for the northern pintail. And this is from eBird. How many of you guys know about eBird? It's a fantastic resource. Look it up online. It allows you to keep a checklist of all the birds that you've seen. And so anytime you go outside, you can keep a checklist. There's a mobile app for it. And birders all over the world use eBird. And it's a great way to store your life list and then also to see where to go birding. And so all these purple squares are where birders have been out and have seen northern pintails. So that's pretty amazing that people have birded all these areas. And it shows up really well as the birds range because we have lots of eBirders all over the world. Okay, next slide. And if you'll start that um, video going, 
if you click on the um, the arrow at the bottom left, yep. Oh. All right, so what this is showing is eBird data. Wait, I'm trying yeah, to just click that arrow. Oh, there, there we go. go. Wow, Okay. very cool. So this is cool. This is actually showing pintail movements throughout the year based on eBird data. This is citizen scientists like you and me that are going out birding and entering their data. And now we can actually see birds moving across the landscape. That's uh, there during the summertime, they're up north. Now it's fall, they're migrating south. You can see them showing up in Mexico, Florida, Texas, and so forth. So, so that's really awesome. That's, that's great citizen science data showing movements of birds. And um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology that runs eBird has, now has enough data from, from hundreds of birds now to show these migration animations. And if you go to the eBird website, you can you can see these for other species of birds. You can see their migrations. You can see their, where they're wintering and where they're where they're breeding. Very cool, right? Yeah. Uh, next slide. Okay, so courtship and pair formation. So this is another thing that's really different about ducks. It takes place on the wintering grounds. Um, in other birds, what happens most typically is that um, birds are on the wintering grounds, but then in the spring, the males leave first and they head back up north to their breeding grounds. They set up a territory and they look to attract a mate once they're back on the breeding grounds. And the females return a little bit later, they fly around, they search the different territories, they look at the male's resources on the territories, they look at the male and they choose a mate. Well, in ducks, it's different. The, pair, the courtship and pair formation take place on the wintering grounds. And what happens is they have like group courtship displays and males will surround a female and compete for her attention with, with ritualized displays. And you can see in the, in the uh, image on the lower left, it's just a diagram showing like in the lower left, that's a drawing of a male doing a grunt whistle display. And there's a photograph in the upper right. And then in part B, that's called the head up, tail up. The male puts his head up and tail up really quickly and the bird in the uh, lower right is doing the head up, tail up. And then in the back, the male is doing a burp or a chin lift to another male. It's kind of like a threat to another male. So if you go to the next slide, I've got a little video showing co uh, males courting in action. So if you'll start that video, I'll explain what's happening. So here's a group of males. That's a grunt whistle. You can can you turn up the volume a little bit on your end too, Christine? Uh, here's a female. Yep. That's the grunt whistle. Then the head up, tail up. Okay, you'll see them do like a body shake. There's the female. See the body shake, the tail shake, and it's like a chain of displays. They'll start the chain, and sometimes they'll go through the whole chain. Sometimes they'll just do one or two parts of the chain but they're all surrounding these females. They're whistling. Oh, it should keep going. Is there a bit more? Oh. Yeah, keep it going. And you can hear the males whistling. And they'll show off their, um, oh, it should keep going, Christine. Not sure why it keeps stopping. That's the head up, tail up. And they're giving little whistles while they do this display, these displays. And see how they're turning the back of their head. They're showing off to the female, the back of their head. There she is. She's got like four or five males courting her. Does the head up, tail up, turns toward her. They do that burp display where their head goes up and down. They're giving a whistle. There's another grunt whistle. Head up, tail up, turn toward the female. Head up, tail up, and hear the whistles. So cute. I love Very it. Very cool. Right. And so when the female chooses a male, she'll start following the male that she fall that she's chosen and give it, and it's called the inciting displays. And she makes little clucking noises where she's following the male that she's chosen and she's rejecting the other birds. <laughs> So very, very cool. So if you go out onto the wintering grounds, um, you know, in many parts of the U.S. and, and their wintering ground in Mexico and South America, the Caribbean, you can see this courtship happening. And another thing that pintails do is they have aerial courtship called pursuit flights, where a group of males will follow the female and try to court her in the air. They'll be whistling and calling to her in the air and males will be trying to compete in the air and, and maneuver close to the female. And they're quite um, acrobatic. These ducks can can whirl and twirl in the air and make sudden rapid dives. And so again, it's a way for the males to um, compete and, and um, attract the attention of the female. 
So um, actually as a postdoc researcher, I did a study on Northern pintails and their, and their courtship and pair, dis and, uh, pair formation. And I studied what it was that females were choosing when they choose a mate. And um, what I learned was that I, while well, I set up the ducks, I would have three males in separate compartments and I would let the female swim in front of her and look at the different males and score and, and then see which male she chose based on the way they looked. And then I did a second experiment where the males were allowed to court with the female. And then I looked again to see what it was that she was choosing. And what I found was that the, fem the males with the really beautiful, long, gorgeous tertials with lots of iridesc iridescence, and then the males with the pure white breasts were the ones that were chosen. And then the males that also courted a lot and were really attentive to the female were chosen. So well, again, a male showing, <laughs> yeah, a male showing that he's courting and that he's really attentive would signal that, um, you know, he's interested in the female and, and is going to give her a lot of mate uh, protection during the, the pair formation and, and breeding process. All right, next slide. Oh, so Lisa, um, so they meet up in the winter grounds and That's then right. do they fly together as a pair up That's north right. to the prairie potholes? Yes. So go to the next slide. So what happens so, if something happens to one of them while they're in flight, while they're en route? Ah, well, if they lose a mate, uh, they can try to pair up on the breeding grounds. That's what would okay. happen. So okay. what happens in these birds is that the sex ratio is skewed to more males than females. And that's true for a lot of ducks. And the reason again is because females are more vulnerable to predation since they're the ones that nest and raise the ducklings. So a lot of males will end up unpaired. So if a female loses her mate, she'll be able to easily find another mate. If a male loses his mate, he'll probably be unpaired because all the females will be paired up when they go back to the wintering grounds. So here on the lower left, you can see what the prairie pothole region looks like. The male follows his mate back to her natal area. That is the area where she was born. And again, it's thought that that's advantageous because of course she knows the landscape, she knows the wetlands. She'll often come back to the same wetland where she's nested before because she knows the resources that are there and she's familiar with it. So this, this kind of behavior is very different from other birds where the females, you know, they, they pair up on the breeding grounds and um, the males go back to their home territories first. Here, it's the female going back to her home range and the males following her. Okay, next slide. All right, so the nesting takes place in the spring. Um, females build a nest in a depression on the ground. Um, they lay their eggs and they put a lot of down and, and around the nest to keep it warm. Um, clutch size is like typically seven or eight eggs. It can be as many as 12 in some areas. Next. Um, you can see um, here a female with the downy ducklings next. Um, the ducklings hatch after about 25 days of incubation. The females lay one egg per day and incubate for 25 days or so. Um, and the ducklings leave the nest within about 24 hours. They're born precocial, which means that they're covered with down. They can move and self feed by themselves. The females will guard them and brood them but they're perfectly capable of um, walking around and swimming around on their own within 24 hours of hatching. As you know, many other birds are, are born naked and blind and helpless and totally dependent on the parents to feed them. And that's a different, different kind of strategy. It's called altricial. And with ducks, the females invest a lot of um, nutrition in the eggs. So the eggs are big and the ducks are formed, you know, born downy and, and ready to go. And that's called precocial ducklings. Okay, next. Lisa, we have a comment. Uh, Emma says, uh, the courtship is wonderful. We all like attentive males. Oh, I agree with you, Emma. <laughs> and I, I'd love to have babies that were uh, independent instantly. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Humans uh, have the longest parental care of any species. <laughs> yeah. Like 18 years of parental care. So it's quite different from the bird world. <laughs> where it's just a few months, a couple months or a few weeks even. All right. So what happens then is that... Um, Early in incubation, males leave their mates, okay? They guard her during egg laying. Um, and what they're trying to do during egg laying is protect her from, from breeding with other males. And in ducks, something that's called extra pair copulations or forced extra pair copulations are really common. And paired males will go out and try to mate with other females and they do this by force. Um, and so if you've spent time work, walk, watching ducks, you might have seen this happen where, where ducks will be chasing other females and trying to mate with them. So males guard their mates because, of course, they don't want to be cuckolded. They want to be the father of all the all the eggs in the in the nest. 
Um, but research has shown that, that many females have ducks, ducklings that are fathered by a number of different males, which is crazy. But that's true in a lot of the bird world, actually. Um, it's not as monogamous as we thought. There's a lot of cheating going on. So um, what happens is that the males, once he's inseminated the female and protected her during egg laying, he ditches her, he's gone. And he goes off and undergoes a wing molt. And what many people don't realize is that ducks go entirely flightless for several weeks. They completely shed all their flight feathers and then they grow a new set in summer. And so the males do that first. Um, they will go into what's called a hiding plumage or eclipse plumage. And that is a male on the upper left. He goes into, um, you know, very camouflage plumage that looks just like the female and he drops all his wing feathers and grows new ones. And so when the female, when she's done, um, raising the ducklings, and she also goes through the wing molt. So they, they again both have a, this flightless period. And that picture in the lower right was taken in October. You can see the males just starting to get his breeding plumage again. So they're going to be molting back into their breeding plumage in the fall and winter. So often if you see ducks in the wintertime, um, even January, February, the males and females still look very much alike. They don't start to get their breeding plumage until different periods of time in, in the winter and spring. So you got to be aware of that and not just think it's a bunch of females. It could be males that are in this um, in this basic non-breeding plumage until they get their breeding plumage sometime during the winter. All right, next. Uh, Lisa, we're running a little short yep, of time. I'm almost <laughs> done. <We've got> a <laughs> more okay, so fall migration after, after both birds um, go through the wing molt, then they go through the fall migration. Again, they head to their wintering grounds and then the whole cycle begins again. Next slide. Yeah, so the uh, wing molt is true for all ducks. They all go through this flightless period. Okay, so quickly, just what are some threats to northern pintails? Well, there's a lot of loss of habitat from agriculture and development. Um, there's climate change, which is causing long-term, you know, trends in drying. Um, periodic droughts cause wetlands to dry up. You know, that's kind of cyclical. There will be wet periods and dry periods, but it does cause numbers to go down when there isn't good habitat, that the birds aren't successful nesting. They don't survive as well. Um, pesticides and other contaminants are a problem in, in food sources. Um, it's found it's been found that um, ducks ingest plastic. We're finding that it is true in so many other species of birds. And then um, pintail ducks, like other ducks, are also hunted. And um, thankfully, it is well managed, so it's done sustainably. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service um, with pintails and other ducks, they do lots of surveys of ducks and they make sure that we're not shooting more ducks than are available. And actually hunting has been quite good for waterfowl conservation because duck hunters support conservation of wetlands and restoration of habitats. So fortunately, because of the strong interest in, in wildlife and ducks in particular, there's lots of um, good habitat and conservation measures that are going on, such as restoring habitat. Good news. All right, so next slide. So um, that concludes my little presentation on pintails. I hope you found it exciting. Um, I would suggest that you go birding, go look for ducks in your area, pintails, teal, other species that might be nearby you. Um, spend some time watching them. They're beautiful and fascinating birds to watch. And so you can notice some of the behaviors that I pointed out today, maybe see some courtship and feeding and, and competition between males um, for the females um, pair bond. Um, they're really beautiful and interesting birds to watch. So I encourage you to get out there and look for some migratory ducks this time of year. And I think that's it. Take it away, Christine. And so what are some of the advantages of sketching? I know most of you guys here, uh, if you're on, especially if you're signed up for this class today, you love to sketch or you love birds or both. And, um, but if you're a bird watcher and you've never tried sketching, I really suggest it. It's gonna really help you to see those field marks like Lisa was talking about. And so I don't want you to be worried about what the final product is in your sketchbook, no matter how uh, bad it looks. If you think it's even just like a stick figure of a duck, doesn't matter. It, what matters is the time you spent looking at something with 100% focus. That's going to help you remember all those field marks. So I love to travel all over the world. I'm bird watching. And so here I am in uh, Guatemala sketching. And um, so anyway, what are the par parts of the duck to notice when sketching? We talked about this a lot already. So Lisa did a really good job for that. Um, and so let's see. 
Um, oh, let's see, where did I put that now? Yeah, um, yeah, she talked about that already. So anyway, in terms of the um, uh, drawing them, I like people to think about this concept I call the six-step roadmap to sketching success. And so it kind of breaks it down really easily into just six things to think about while you're drawing. And so first I like to have you think about blocking in the basic shapes. And I usually start with the core body and then start adding on the circles and rectangles and triangles um, shapes. And I start thinking about proportions then. So when I'm adding the head, maybe the head is half the size um, of the body here. And maybe the tail is a third of the length. Then I like to have um, you think about alignment. So what structures are aligned with other structures? So in this little European robin, its bill is aligned with its big proud chest and its two legs are um, pretty much aligned. The toes are aligned. And then I like people to think about flow lines or basically how that line is flowing over the, the animal or plant, um, just like how water would flow over a boulder. Is it smooth or is it jagged? Then I like you to think about angles, uh, especially looking at those nice negative shapes that we see here. Uh, are those uh, 90 degree angles or 30 degree or 120? And then lastly, looking at negative shapes. Um, so that's the part that isn't the bird. And that really shows up well when it's got a white background like this. But if it's in real life, hopefully you can notice that too. Okay, so then, um, so in this case, this is the bird, uh, the image we're going to sketch. So in terms of talking about those four ideas, proportions, like we see um, how small the head is compared to the big fluffy oval of the body. Uh, we see different angles here and different uh, kind of negative shapes as well, like this uh, very small angle here between the bill and the chest. Um, and we see uh, negative shapes like down here between the two legs. There's a nice big uh, rectangle between them. And there's a uh, kind of a 90 degree, maybe a little bit less than that angle between the neck and the back. And so in terms of anatomy and field marks, we talked about most of those things already. Lisa did a great job at that. Uh, we just want to um, really notice, you know, like she said, the shape of the bill. Uh, the end of the bill has this little hook on it that's um, kind of very subtle. And don't forget that birds do have a nostril as well, although it's very hidden here in the black um, melanin of the bill. And they've got this big old fat puffy cheek. And they've got a relatively small eye. And that eye is sitting on top of that big fluffy cheek. And here we have another really good image where you can see that, uh, that nostril even better. And the um, upper and lower mandible, as Lisa said, um, it's kind of flattened on the bottom. And, um, and that that lower uh, jaw, um, lower mandible is uh, very skinny. And so mostly of what we see of the bill is the upper mandible. And it's got this tiny little smile right there. And there it is again from a different angle. And uh, like Lisa talked about, we saw the speculum. Um, and that uh, shows a little bit in our bird that we're drawing today. And here it shows how different it is in different lights, lighting conditions. So be careful of that when you're out birding and you're trying to look for field marks because things can be uh, dark or they can be much brighter depending on the lighting conditions. And like Lisa said, they have these big fluffy uh, scapulars that are kind of hanging over the rest of the body depending on their position. And here's uh, just an image of all the feathers. And you can see really obviously this big long tail feather. They have a pair of those big black long tail feathers. That's why they're called a pintail. And here, um, here's an example of where the bird is at rest with its um, his head kind of uh, stuck down next to its chest and its back. And then here is where it's lifted up, like um, Lisa was showing uh, during the courtship rituals. So you want to kind of notice that when you're sketching. <laughs> and there's that long tail again. 
And then the feet. So um, as as ducks, you know, they have these webbed feet and we can mainly see these three toes that come out towards the front. So kind of like your normal uh, songbird, they've got three toes in the front and one in the back, although it's very, very tiny in these guys and we can't really see it very well, but it's right there. Uh, but unlike songbirds, uh, they've got webbing between these um, these little triangular webbings between the toes. And here's another uh, image that shows that back toe, that fourth toe, just a little bit better here um, that we're going to want to draw in our drawing. And then they do have small little nails uh, that help them <laughs> walk. And um, they're, they're better walkers than other kinds of ducks. So uh, Lisa um, alluded to that a little bit, that these guys are called dabbling ducks. And that means they just kind of tip themselves up and they dabble along getting their food. And they um, can walk pretty well with those feet right under them. But that's a little bit different than a whole other group of ducks that are called diving ducks that um, have a different anatomy and their feet are way much farther back on their bodies and they can't walk as well. And so here's a really good image from this wonderful manual of ornithology, just showing you a little bit better because we can't see that uh, very well in our um, in our photograph. But again, we're going to notice that there's a small back toe and then there's the three front facing toes with the two triangles of webbing and the very small nails. And then um, before we go on to the video um, of how to sketch them, I want to remind you uh, that we're going to have, um, encourage you to post your sketches with the hashtag um, WMBD 2020 Carib, which is for World Migratory Bird Day, okay? So anyway, uh, and also before I cut out of this slideshow and start showing our video demonstration, is to remind you of our third and last in our series, this um, Discover and Sketch the Barn Owl on October 29th. And we'll be reminding you about that again more um, on our Facebook page, on both Facebook pages. And also if you are here on Crowdcast, if you're watching me on Crowdcast, you can go ahead and follow me on Crowdcast and you can see and sign up for that um, in, over there. Uh, so every, is everybody ready to start sketching? So again, if you didn't get a chance to download the image, you can do that later if you want to, but I'll be showing it here in this in the slideshow. Um, but the blue button down below, if you're on Crowdcast, um, is where it says download your pintail duck image. That's where you would do that. Now, if you're watching on Facebook, you can go ahead and still sign up for this uh, pintail workshop and go over there and download it. And you'll see links to that on both the Birds Caribbean Facebook page as well as uh, my Facebook page. Good. Uh, so Jamie is ready to sketch. Or actually, Jamie's your mom. Who is that watching us today? Is that Lori, Aaliyah, or Sarah? Tell us in the chat box. And so usually I just kind of air draw, kind of looking at all the parts first, and then we're going to get started. So we'll very lightly make a circle for the head, and um, we're going to make that kind of just a circle-ish oval, very, very light with a feather-like touch, the lightest touch that you can possibly make. And then a nice line with the bill, just going at a kind of a 30-degree angle maybe. We're just going to block in all the parts very lightly first before we go back and get the details. And I'll show you a close up picture of the head and the feet when we work on those. So we're just getting the circles and the triangles of the beak and the head. I'm going to go back to those later. Then we're going to get that neck and we're measuring uh, basically to get our correct proportions, getting that nice arched chocolate colored neck that comes down into the breast. And then we're going to get that looking at those flow lines again and those angles of the cheek and the white breast there is about a 30 degree angle. And then we're going to make a nice big oval for the body and we're going to measure that. You can see I'll be measuring the height and the width of that. So I'm kind of double checking. I had my, my uh, line a little bit low, so that's why I always do that. So we're going to measure the width of the body and the depth. 
getting that neckline and the back line very lightly. We're going to add all those uh, wing and tail feathers later. So we're just getting a nice oval for the main body from the white chest to the white little rump. <laughs> so we're measuring that width. You see, I had that a little bit too wide. So that's why I have you start out super light. So you don't, um, you know, you don't worry about uh, erasing too much. We're not, you see, I haven't done any erasing yet because I'm staying so light and loose. And we'll do a little bit of erasing later on. So we're just noticing where the tail is and that line right there where the tucked wing and the tail is. Just that angle indicating that super quick. Now remember, you can always watch this replay anytime you want. Uh, and to go over these steps again if, you, uh, if we're going too fast. <laughs> We're just getting the oval. Now we're going to notice where the two legs are and we're getting the details of the legs later. So I'm just showing the leg and kind of a triangle for the uh, for the bird's right foot. We'll get those details later. And then for the bird's left foot, and he's kind of pushing away. So it's kind of angled away. It's a little bit different angle than that first one because he's walking. Remember, these are dabbling ducks. They walk better than diving ducks. And noticing the width between those two legs. So I had mine a little bit too far apart, so I'm fixing that. Again, you see I haven't done any erasing because I'm drawing so lightly. Um, and I'm hoping that you will uh, be drawing very lightly too. We'll, we'll firm up all of these lines a little bit later. So first now we've got the overall shape here, just double checking our proportions, the overall height of the bird, looking everywhere. Okay, how are we doing so far? Aaliyah and Lori, you guys doing okay? Everybody else following along? So what we've done is we have just blocked in the basic shapes, those circles and triangles and ovals for the whole body. And we're gonna go back over the body later, but we're gonna start with the head so that now you see a larger image of the head so you can draw it more accurately, okay? So we're really gonna now look at the eye and the big puffy cheek and try to get the triangle of the bill uh, and that nice kind of blue gray spot on the bill a little bit better. Okay, so you guys keeping up? Somebody say in the chat box, yes. <laughs> I know in Facebook, I don't think you can do that, but I hope we are um, keeping up. Great. Okay, so now we're gonna look really closely at this head, just the structure of the head and gonna add all those parts, okay? Okay, so just double checking the width of the head from the um, forehead to the neck. Just firming up that line. So now you can go a little bit darker. So I, you can see that I'm getting the uh, back of the head a little bit more rounded than I had before. Hi, Christine P. Welcome. Oh, thanks. Popped on over from the Wild Wonder. Yes, great. So we're just firming up the, uh, the forehead and the back of the neck, that beautiful chocolate head and neck. So now we're going to work on the bill. You see it's really angled right here. So it's kind of steep and then it goes shallow. And it's a pretty narrow bill. Uh, so keep it pretty narrow. So we have a tendency to draw things larger if we think they're important. So if we're, we think the bill and the eyes are important, we tend to draw them too large. So really be double checking your widths. In fact, I probably even have my bill a little bit too thick right here. I think I might be fixing it later. But anyway, now we've got that big puffy cheek. If you could see this bird from the front, you'd see just how puffy his cheeks are. <laughs> he looks like they're stuffed like a chipmunk. <laughs> and that eye sits on top of that big oval of the puffy cheek. And again, make sure that you're not making it too large. It's relatively small compared to their head. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. So now firming up that big puffy cheek. Kind of that big half moon shape of the cheek. Now looking at the bill again, 
And the bill has these little angles that you might not be able to see in the photograph, but they're kind of this, these uh, kind of a W shape, actually, if you looked at it from the side, where the bill is coming into the um, head and, uh, and the mouth. Now, remember that bill has a little uh, corner, a little um, beak uh, on it. Oh, no, they call it a nail. Sorry, a little bit of a nail at the end. And then that little smile at the bottom there. So you see a very tiny bit of that lower mandible. And then we see that white part that is on the upper mandible. And uh, we don't know what the function of that is. We don't always know what the function of things are in birds or any animals. But anyway, it's a really cool little stripe that's very diagnostic for this species. So we got that. So one more time, we're going to firm up the head before we move on. Firm up that cute puffy cheek and really noticing those negative shapes between the cheek and the white neck. Because we're going to start on that next. Noticing how that, yeah, noticing the, the neck there. And then that nice, big, puffed out, proud chest. And look how far forward it comes. Thank you, Witha. Okay, now I'm drawing that uh, chocolate part there and that very diagnostic uh, stripe that comes up behind the cheek onto the, um, the back of the neck back of that chocolate neck and that beautiful bronzy part that Lisa had told us about that the uh, male very beautifully shows off. <laughs> and if you just popped in here late, make sure to watch the replay because uh, Lisa had a wonderful introduction to the biology of this species and some wonderful videos, uh, some wonderful videos on, on um, their uh, biology and their behavior. Okay, so how are we doing? We got the head. Any any questions so far about the shape of the head? Now, I didn't draw it, but remember there is a nostril. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but right here, there's a tiny little mark for the nostril. It's kind of an elongated oval there. So you would put that on your drawing right there. I kind of forgot to do that. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so now we're going to move on to firming up the, the shape of the the body, and then moving on to the wings and the tail. And then finally at the legs of the last. So make that big, proud, puffy white chest and then down into the bottom there. The line right there is stronger in front of the right foot than it is here in, in the left because the left is in front. So we're going to leave that. Make sure you leave that. Now we're just firming up that little um, area in the back. We notice there's that black mark but under the tail. And then that white mark. And so we're just firming up those lines. So that bright white uh, rump there is pretty characteristic. Now the tail, it's called a pin tail, so we're measuring the length of that tail. Those are actually the two central tail feathers. It's only those that are longer and darker and uh, tell us the name of the species, basically. The pin tail. Now going back, we're going to look at this line. We're going to start working on the uh, wing. And we're going to look at this uh, angle there and look at where the wing is tucked under there and measuring uh, to make sure we've got that line correct. Oops, <laughs> dropped, my, dropped my pencil there. And so before we move on, just want to notice here that most of the wing is tucked under. So when we saw the pictures of the bird flying with the primary flight feathers out and the secondaries and the, and the speculum and all that, um, that's kind of all tucked under here. You see the speculum, uh, actually the um, kind of greenish blue part of the speculum showing, but that's about all because they're really tucked under, especially when they're just relaxed or walking 
walking around or just sitting uh, in the water and they're relaxed, most of that wing is tucked under and invisible. So we can't see any of the primaries uh, or the secondaries here. We just see the we just see the base of the secondaries that is part of the speculum, that colored um, part. And what the mostly or what we're looking at right now are these big, long feathers from the back, the scapular feathers. And then we also see three tertials. Those are, um, as their name implies, tertials. There's three of them. And those are actually the first three feathers of the secondaries. I know it's kind of confusing, but the wing is made up of tertials and secondaries and primaries. Okay, so anyway, we're gonna start drawing this line and then filling in those scapulars and tertials. And just noticing the width there, making sure we're gonna put that line in the right place. And we're gonna draw a little triangle there for our speculum. And later on, if you're going to add color to this, you don't have to fill that in. Um, but uh, you might want to do that later, looking at the reference photos earlier in this slideshow to get your colors right. Because he's a little bit shadowed right here. The lighting is a little flat. So now I'm adding the three tertials that we see. So the more you know about bird anatomy and feathers, the easier it is to see these parts. Uh, I know when I first started sketching birds, I was so intimidated <laughs> by all of these different parts. But the more you know about any organism that you want to draw, the easier it is going to be to see it in the field like it is and to um, look for those diagnostic features. Uh, and so anyway, I just drew the um, the, the bird's right wing is, is um, poking out over here. I mean, sorry, yeah, his his right wing is poking out over there and the rest of the left wing is tucked under um, these fluffy feathers, okay? So I just drew that triangle for the um, right wing. Um, I think those are the primaries that are sticking out. Now we're gonna add those longer, uh, skinnier, kind of wispy, um, what do you call these, the, the scapular feathers. And so I'm just kind of measuring where there's, those are, and they're kind of in two clumps. The, um, the bird's left clump that's um, falling over right here, we're drawing those long, thin sort of triangles. Those are like, you know, three or four or five of the scapulars, and those are covering uh, the, the primary flight feathers right now and the secondaries. So those don't have to be too perfect. They're kind of disorganized. There's a whole bunch of them. They're not really named and counted like the other feathers are. Okay, so now I'm adding the three tertials, which are named and counted. And you can kind of see maybe from this photograph that they have a light edge and a dark edge. We'll add that later. Now we're noticing, again, I'm just gonna darken up the, the speculum, which is those uh, beautiful iridescent feathers of the secondaries that you can really see when they're flying. I'm gonna kind of darken up that primary and darken up the tail just to start uh, kind of dividing up all these triangular areas so we're not gonna get confused about what's what before we move on. We're not going to have time to add a lot of shadowing, uh, so you can do that later, especially if you have colored pencils or watercolors, you can do that later on your own. Okay, lastly, we're going to add the feet. So remember, these are ducks, so they've got the webbed feet. They've got pretty sturdy um, upper legs, a lot sturdier and thicker than songbirds because they're doing a lot more walking around on the ground and also a lot of paddling, so they're really strong. So make those pretty wide compared to what you do for a songbird. Then notice that one little triangle in the back that you can't really see, but we saw earlier in the photographs. That's that um, toe that in songbirds is the one that's wrapping around the back of a, uh, a branch when they're perched. Of course, these guys don't really perch. Okay, so now I'm drawing the uh, toes, the individual toes, and then we're gonna join them with the webbing. And so the longest toe is that um, of the left, no, <laughs> the longest toe of his right foot is the very rightmost one. So that's longer and farther forward than the middle one. 
And now we're adding the uh, half circle, those little triangles for the webbing. Now that third toe is pointing kind of, is foreshortened, it's pointing almost straight at us. So it's gonna be shorter and kind of wider. And then add the little nail and the webbing. Now the back foot, remember he's walking, so he's kind of pushing off with his left foot. So it's going back at an angle more than the other one that's just standing on the ground. So make sure it looks like it's pushing back and it's pretty sturdy. And we got that back toe, that little uh, triangle for the back toe. Then um, we're gonna do these other toes that are on the ground, but since he's pushing off and walking, it's a little bit different shape. And I'm just drawing a line there to indicate that we wanna make it a little bit higher as well, because again, he's sort of turning towards us and pushing off. So it's a slightly bit higher on your piece of paper than his right foot, if you notice. And cause it's actually a little bit closer to us in a way. So make sure your toes are sort of bended. There are some individual uh, bones within each toe. They differ depending on which toe it is. But anyway, if you can look closely, uh, they are a bit bent. So there are ang joints, just like in our fingers. So don't make that a really smooth angle. Make sure that you're noticing that these are, um, you know, right here, there's actually some bones and joints, just like in your hand. Um, more obviously in your hand than in your toe, <laughs> right? Now I just added a little bit of um, patterning to the toes and shadowing between the, um, on the, uh, what do you call that? The webbing <laughs> between the duck's toes. And that's about it. And of course, later on, you can add more uh, shadowing. Again, looking at those reference photos within the uh, slideshow, uh, the replay will be ready in just a few moments after the slideshow is. So I am going to, um, let's see, Lisa, are you still here? You want to say goodbye? Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Lisa, do you have any closing thoughts? No, not really. I would just say celebrate migratory birds over the next several days. Um, go to uh, migratorybirdday.org. There's events happening all day today and uh, tomorrow and Saturday. So check out the schedule and join some of the talks that sound interesting to you. Lots of good stuff happening. And then get outside and look for migratory birds too. Enjoy being outside in nature. And I am typing in here the hashtag. It's World Migratory Bird Day 2020 Carib. Right. W, uh, hashtag WMBD. Right. I don't know why I can't ever say that. WMBD 2020 Carib. Right, and you got it. Any social media, post that. Um, we'd love to see your sketches. Go ahead and spend a few more minutes on those or an hour or two if you want to do watercolors or color pencils or whatever you want. And remember, don't worry about the product. Think more about the what you learned about the bird while you were drawing it and observing it closely. And I really encourage you, if you're a bird watcher and if you want to improve your bird um, birding skills and your bird identification skills, to take your sketchbook out there next time and sketch those birds. Okay. Okay. So are we signing off? Everybody yep. Thank you so much, Christine. You really inspired all of us. Great. And I hope you can join us one more time for um, Discover and Sketch the Barn Owl on October 29th. And there'll be links here on my Crowdcast and on both of our Facebook pages and maybe the Bro World Migratory Bird Day folks too. Again, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thanks everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Thanks, Lisa, for joining us with your uh, wonderful expertise. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Bye-bye.